apologize, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Just uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fernanda Quintanilla. I'm the Director of External Affairs with the Tucson Metro Chamber. Thank you for joining our virtual conversation, Mask Mandates and Your Business, a virtual discussion with Dr. Teresa Kahn. Um, the Chamber is committed to staying in the forefront of all matters that impact business, and this is just one example of the benefits offered to our members. If you're interested in getting more involved with the programs and projects that the Chamber's offers, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, Dr. Cullen will begin the conversation with a 10 minute presentation followed by a 20 minute Q&A period. Um, once this period is over, uh, Tim Medcock with Farhang and Medcock will give an additional 10 minute presentation followed by 20 minutes for Q&A. Please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to ask a question um, and I will call on your name and ask you to unmute. We would like to give our speakers an opportunity to address as many questions as possible. So please try to keep your questions brief. Just a quick introduction of Dr. Teresa Cullen. She is the Pima County Public Health Director. Um, in addition to several other medical and public health roles, Dr. Cullen retired from the US Public Health Service in 2012 after 25 years of active duty before becoming the Chief Medical Information Officer and Director of Health Informatics for the Veterans Health Administration. She's a graduate of the University of Arizona College of Medicine and also serves as a clinical associate professor there. So without any further ado, uh, I turn it over to Dr. Cullen. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for asking me to be here. I actually can send you some slide decks when I'm done if you want, but I thought I would just talk because you guys gave me a lot of questions that you thought people would be interested in. So let me give you a sense of where we are in the community right now in terms of uh, COVID. And I'll drive that from the dashboard that we normally use. And I'll talk a little bit about the variant and especially about the Delta variant and then what we anticipate we are gonna see in the next few weeks. So to give you an update with where we are, you may be aware we follow the CDC data tracker. The CDC data tracker, you can actually just put in CDC data tracker county view and you'll be able to follow it. Uh, last Friday, we flipped from substantial transmission to high transmission. High transmission is when we have more than 100, 100 cases per 100,000. You will recall that also turns us red on our county dashboard. Over the weekend, we went between red to substantial and high, but uh, since uh, Sunday night, we've remained uh, high, which means we're now about 108 cases per 100,000. At our highest level in the past, we were more than double that. Uh, if you'll recall, December, January, and February were really terrible months. And during those months, there were times when we were at 250 cases per 100,000. However, a case rate of more than 100 per 100,000 is very alarming to us and concerning. Uh, we do definitely do better than our neighbors to the north. We continue to have case rates that are lower than Pinal and Maricopa, but they are still high and of significance to us. The other thing we look at when we look at the, the vaccine, um, when we look at COVID itself, we look at our positivity rate. And you will recall, if we get to a positivity rate over 10%, we then go into the red which is a high positivity. We had at one point gotten into the green where we had less than 5% positivity. Positivity is the number of tests which are positive for COVID. It can be either an antigen test, which is the rapid test or the PCR, which people know as the nasal test. Right now we are at 11%. We just hit that in the last two days. So what we're seeing is an increased amount of positive cases. Uh, when we test now, when I talk about Delta, I'll give you some insight into why that's happening, but that in itself is concerning. When we're at that rate, it means that we are having rapid transmission in the community. So we have a high case rate, a high positivity rate, and then if we go to the public health response, we have still been able to keep up with our case investigation and contact tracing. Though I will admit the schools are starting to overwhelm us a little. We've just doubled our staff and we just actually, I, reason why I was a little late was I was having a discussion with how to bring on a few more people to help us. Uh, so case investigation, that's when you're a case, we call you up, we ask you pertinent questions, we ask you to tell us who your contacts are. When you're the case, you isolate, 
you isolate for 10 days, um, assuming you're not sick during that time period. It can sometimes be longer. When you're a contact, you quarantine. This kind of gets a little confusing. If you have been fully vaccinated, you do not need to quarantine. You just need to test day three to five. If you have not been fully vaccinated, you need to quarantine for seven days, and we ask you to test day five. The reason why that's important is it's the contacts that really run the risk of infecting other people because they may not feel sick. They may be totally asymptomatic. And so we worry about that in that situation. From a hospital situation, the current situation is that our hospitals are, um, are overwhelmed. Many of them are overwhelmed, not just due to COVID. They are uh, usually in the summer, we have what we call a nadir of our hospital uh, admissions. Our hospital beds are the least full they are throughout the entire year. That did not happen this year. There's met much speculation about that. But right now, many of our hospitals have what we call offloading times. That's how long it takes an ambulance to get somebody from once they arrive at the hospital into either the hospital bed if they're a direct admission or into the emergency room. We had reports last weekend of offloading times of 20 hours. So very, very significant times, which means we back up the entire healthcare system. Once again, that is not all just COVID, but COVID is contributing greatly to it. So what we have is uh, another very concerning time. I think we had actually just, you know, we had been planning a celebration and we decided, well, there's no celebration right now. We're back in the midst of trying to assist the county to have an appropriate response to what we're seeing with COVID. Let me talk briefly about Delta. The, the belief is throughout the country, probably about 85% of the COVID cases are due to the Delta variant. In uh, Pima County itself, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number that are due to Delta. The, the numbers fluctuate every day. I would say right now, I think it's at least 60% of our cases are due to Delta. The reason why that's significant, and I'm going to take you back a long time ago at the very beginning of the pandemic when we talked about the r not value, the number of cases that are infected by an individual that has COVID, the r not value for the Delta variant is thought to be six. That means every person that has an infection due to the Delta variant has the potential to infect six people. That is one reason why you've seen this, once again, a fairly rapid rise in the number of cases in the community that we are seeing. This is consistent with what has been seen throughout the world. Our hope is that we, uh, may do what India and Britain did, which is they had a very, very high escalation of their number of cases and a fairly rapid drop-off. We are still in the increasing stage, but the hope is that we will see um, a rapid drop-off, hopefully, uh, and we will have a sense of that in the next few weeks. Uh, let me talk briefly about schools. We've had over 250 cases in the schools. Um, we've had... Um, I don't know the exact number of right now because we're in the process of looking at some data, but we've had at least 14 outbreaks and outbreaks is two or more cases where the connection is the school as opposed to family or friends. We have closed classrooms. We have not closed any schools. Our goal is to keep schools open. We work closely with the school boards as well as the principals at the individual schools. And we really try to push the the, what we call that layered mitigation step, you know, wear, wash, wait. Um, and let me finally talk about vaccinations. Vaccinations is the way we get ourselves out of this. Um, we, as you know, hit 70%, 18 and over one vaccination. I think it was July 7th. So right after what the current administration had been aiming for, July 4th, our population 65 and over has been in the 90th percentile for probably about the last month now. We are starting to see a minimal increase in those numbers. They had really uh, become very stable. We're at se uh, over 72.5% now in terms of first um, vaccination for 18 and over. The good news for us is the 12 to 17 year olds seem to be vaccinating at a rate that's comparable to what we're seeing in adults, which is really important because it's the way we're really gonna keep our schools open. Um, so that is a really quick overview of where we are with COVID in Pima County. So I will take questions if that's how you wanna do it.
Yeah, let's do it. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, go to your reactions and go ahead and raise your virtual hand and I will call on you and unmute you. And I do see this one question, any idea when the vaccine will be approved for younger kids? So let me talk about a couple different things about this. Um, the, we expect Pfizer to submit for full non-emergency authorization by the end of this month or early September. We expect that approval will go through. We expect the request for five to 11 year olds, not under five, will occur late September, uh, perhaps early October. This is based on conversations with the CDC and with other people. We do know uh, for, in terms of the booster shots, which people keep asking about, we do know that the um the Committee on Immunization Practice, ACIP, meets Friday in an emergency meeting. At that time, they will look at the potential to recommend boosters for immunocompromised. At this point, they have not said if they will uh, include adults 65 and over in that recommendation. So immunocompromised right now would be if you've had a transplant, if you're on, a room, if you have rheumatoid arthritis and you're on some remitting agent, that's an immune modulator. However, we will know more at that meeting. It starts at 1130. I don't know if any of you have time. They're always fascinating meetings to watch. They're broadcast on the web. So, um, so I do think, uh, to go back to this question, we will see uh, immunizations approved for five to 11 year olds. We also do know that Pfizer is doing studies from two to five year olds, um, but we don't expect to see that till late in um, the calendar year. Thank you, Dr. Cullen. Okay, Steve Odenkirk, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute and you can go ahead and ask your question. All right, can you hear me? Yep, we can yes. hear you loud and clear. Great. So th this is a pessimistic perspective, but it seems to me like a math problem that someone ought to answer. So I'm going to ask here and see if someone can. If we're simply unable to motivate a, a meaningful percentage of the population to get vaccinated, because everybody's talking about vaccinations are the way out, but if we're not going to make them mandatory, it can't be the only way out because we'll, we'll never get to the 70% or whatever the magic number is, because if we can't get people to do it voluntarily. So the question becomes, if we get a nominal amount of additional people vaccinated and the rest of the population is subject to getting the illness and hopefully recovering from it, where do those lines cross as to some type of herd immunity and the whole thing starts to diminish because between the vaccination group and the folks that have already had it and gotten over it, it starts to have nowhere to go. That's my question. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so let me tell you where most of us are thinking now because of the variant, like I would have had a different response to you um, two or three months ago, but what we're seeing with the Delta variant and then what we're seeing in terms of the changes that are in the Lambda variant, which you guys have probably heard of, uh, make the discussion about what is herd immunity a little different than it happened in the past. You will recall that we had multiple times talk about 70, 75% herd immunity. Now, because of what we're seeing, and it's all related, you guys have seen the image of the coronavirus, right? Like it has all those little spikes. It's the changes that are going on and the spike proteins that are making it, for instance, with Delta, more likely to hang out in your nose, more likely to to replicate quickly. The thinking now is that to get to herd immunity, we will probably need to be at 90%. And once again, that's a, in some ways I say to people, I feel like we're throwing stuff on the wall. None of us really know, but we think at 90% what and an immunity that does not wane, right? So the fact that you've been sick, may, gave you enough antibodies, which we believe if you were COVID positive, but didn't get really sick, you probably don't have a high level of antibodies, that you had a good immune response to the vaccination you've gotten, um, that at 90%, we may be okay. Steve, and the thinking is that kind of where you're going with this, that that other 10% may have just some low level antibody response, because that's what herd immunity relies on, right? That there's enough people that it can't transmit. This rapid transmission we're seeing with Delta is what's 
very concerning because of the number, the rapidity with the rise. Um, so I think there's a few ways we approach this. One is uh, we as the health department are responsible to try to get people that haven't been immunized and are amenable to, uh, to being immunized access to that. I, I don't wanna say that everybody that hasn't been immunized hasn't done it because, well, well, there's varied reasons why people haven't been immunized. And we know there's a group that haven't been immunized for multiple reasons. Some of it is their wage work workers and they're worried they can't afford to miss three days of work. Some of it is somebody they knew had a really bad reaction and now they're really scared. This whole concept of what is response, that's the health department. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and then what we need to do is ensure until we can get to that higher level of immunity that we do layered mitigation. You guys, I'm sure are aware that we are consistent with the CDC. We believe that masks in public indoor places are recommended. That does not mean if you're home with your family, you're home with everybody you know, your, your extended family's there, everybody's been immunized, you're going back and forth. I would not say you need to wear a mask in that situation, but. But, um, and then the other thing is the variance and how much mutation we're gonna see. And I um, have actually said today on a call, I wanna quit using the word outbreak because I think every time I use that, people think of the horrible movies. Um, really what we're seeing is significant clusters of infections and we can almost always trace them to close contact between people. So I don't have a great answer. Uh, all I know is we just need to keep working. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, Nick Wayne. Hey, how's it going? Uh, thank you, Dr. Cohen, for all the information today. Um, so as a business owner, um, I guess the big question is, is there anything we can foresee or prepare for right now um, as far as going back into uh, just kind of the, the procedures we were doing previously, uh, masks, plexiglass, all that, should we mentally prepare ourselves? You know, I think from the health department perspective, and I will tell you, um, we, we've had lots of conversations with schools. So in some ways, this is a similar conversation for me. Our goal is to keep you open. Our goal is to not do anything to impede business. It's not to do anything to impede people feeling safe sending their kids back to school. We think that uh, we've learned a lot in the, uh, in the last 15, 18 months. Um, we've learned that, and we have a vaccine. So the key thing we can do is tell people to vaccinate, to try, and that's why this word outbreak worries me. I, we walk this fine line. We don't wanna frighten people because we don't believe fear usually, I mean, fear sometimes changes behavior, but most of the time it doesn't. So we wanna have people reassured that we want them to go out. We want them to go to business. We want them to go eat. We want them to feel safe, but we need businesses, and you guys have all done this, to, to engage in layered mitigation as much as you can. And so the bad thing about the last 18 months is there's lots of lessons learned. The good thing about the last 18 months is there's lots of lessons learned. And you will not, uh, I, I can, I don't wanna say never, but right now, if I look at my little funky colored crystal ball and I look to the future, I don't see a time where we're gonna come out and say lock down. Um, because I think we have learned that we, there may have been a time we needed to lock down. I don't, I don't want to second guess what happened before, but as we go to the future, I think it's really working with partnerships, with businesses, with the community. Um, I would tell you, I, I'm pretty strong uh, mass supporter. Um, when I'm asked, um, and just so you know, District 1 asked me, and I said, yeah, I'll write a letter saying I support that you guys you guys should do that. You're making that decision. I'm not making that decision for you. But if you want to know if I think masking in schools is essential, yes, the answer is I do think that. For business, I, I think, is there an appropriate time for masking? Is there not an appropriate time? Yeah. You, I, and you guys all know this, right? Like there, there's not any new magic information coming out that I can share with you. Thank you, Dr. Cullen. Um, Angela de Aquis. So, go ahead. Yes, and ask your you question. got that right. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> so, my question is really similar to what Nick asked, but um, 
I feel like I may not be alone in this where we recently did relax a lot of our protocols and are now in a situation where we feel mm -hmm. like we need to unwind that and um, looking at presenting my leadership with things that we should be considering at a minimum. And I'm feeling like to encourage vaccination, you know, we should be considering providing an incentive to employees to get vaccinated, offer it on site if that's an option, offer on site testing if that's something that needs to happen. But again, all of this just to send the message to our employees that their safety is our priority, as well as do whatever we can to keep ourselves open. So I just wanted to hear your input on that. Um, I, so I totally agree with you. Let me uh, let me talk to you about something that we're, we are we are in the process of figuring out how we can do this. Um, San Francisco started this amazing thing, five or more. If you have five or more people, you call up the health department, they come out with a team. They either test or vaccinate. So on the Sunday, I said, you guys, well, we need to do this. You guys are probably aware we did homebound vaccination to thousands of people one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, if we are... We're, tr we're in the process of setting this up. So I, I don't know, I, I don't think it's gonna be before this weekend, but our hope Angela is we would do that. Like if you knew you had five people, we would come out and do that, uh, to give you vaccinations. In terms of testing, you know, the testing sites are still out there, but there's also um, by next now home kits. Now those are the rapid antigen, tests. We have a, we don't have a lot of them. It would, may seem like a lot to you guys. We have a couple thousand, but it's not very many for what we need to do with them. But we would be more than willing to work with any business that's interested in terms of helping guide you through what might be a way and an appropriate approach for you to approach, uh, to look at testing in your in your staff or in your employees. Um, so I, I do think that this is a partnership and you guys are a huge uh, component of us being successful. But I think the more we do at the point of care, and I would argue businesses is the point of care, uh, the better, the more successful we'll all be. Thank you. Um, Janelle Rosenfeld. Hi, thank you. Um, quick question. I think it's a quick question. I um, do hear some response from some people saying, that the vaccine, although it was approved for emergency use, is not fully approved and therefore is not proven safe. And therefore there are some holdouts on being vaccinated due to that. Do you have a good response for me for that? Well, I, I, I think it is, uh, it's an issue. Um, and the FDA is aware that it's an issue. There are people that are reluctant. It was approved under what we call an EUA emergency use authorization, Pfizer, Moderna, and J and J. Uh, the Pfizer is the one that we believe will go first for the through the queue for full authorization, so that that will lift the emergency authorization. Uh, we know that there are some businesses who have talked about requiring vaccines for their employees and that they've been concerned because it has had the emergency use authorization. You're probably aware, I was active duty 25 years, you're probably aware DOD is gonna require it. That we actually thought that they would wait for the EUA to be lifted, but they're not waiting. Um, so I, I think people that have that concern, first off, they should be reassured. The country has given over 100 million vaccines. We have a thing called VAERS Vaccine Adverse Effects uh, Reporting System that we do report into and uh, most providers report into. Individuals can report into that too. Uh, so we, uh, we do track the adverse events. They are very, very, very minimal. Uh, but for people that are concerned that they want a full authorization because that word emergency use, is, that term is concerning to them. Um, the good news is I think you're gonna see that in late September. So we're probably okay. looking at six to eight weeks before you get that for Pfizer. The other ones will be delayed. You'll recall Pfizer came out of the shoot earlier than everybody else. And it's just a matter of time for the other guys. Oh, quick follow-up, what about boosters? Yeah, that's the thing that the um, 
Commission on Immunization Practices, Committee on Immunization Practices is looking at this Friday. Those are boosters for immunocompromised, uh, people like that have had transplants. The, uh, and we expect them to make a recommendation on Friday. None of us are totally clear what their recommendation will be. They may, their recommendation may be, we don't think we need them yet. Um, I think the, from a community perspective, the estimate is people that fall into, it's a pretty strict definition of what's immunocompromised, is probably less than 20,000 people in the entire county. It's not a very high number. But if that recommendation is for 65 and over to get boosters, all of a sudden you are over 100,000 people again, that need to get boosters. So it's kind of a wait and see. I follow this data really closely and I have to say it's, it's unclear to me. I think, I think what you're probably, if I had to guess, I think what you're gonna see is immunocompromised will probably get a push to get boosters, but 65 and over may be delayed and follow that for a while. We have time for one more quick question for Dr. Cullen. Does anyone else um, want to raise their virtual hand and ask a question? Just click on the reactions tab and raise your hand. Okay, Chris Seidman, you are the lucky winner. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't have a question so much as just kind of asking about our policy. So we are a theater and we just started having in-person performances last week. Uh, we have required our entire volunteer staff to be to provide proof of vaccination. And in addition to that, we've also required all of everyone in the building to wear a mask ex with the only exception being our performers on stage. And so we feel like this is um, safe and proactive, at, at, as safe as we can get at this point. And I just wanted to get your feedback on uh, uh, us proceeding that, that way. Well, Chris, it's a hard one. Um, I think is. you can proceed. I think what people need to, I'm trained in, as a family medicine doc, which means I live with ambiguity. Uh, however, I practice as an emergency room doc, which means I'm really precise and I wanna make a decision and save you. And you are in between both of those worlds, right? You are, it sounds like you are doing everything you can do to create a safe environment. And right now, I think that that's the most we can ask of people. Um, make sure people are vaccinated, make sure people stay home when they're ill, make sure people screen if they get a hot, low fever or something, they don't go out, that the incentive is there for them to stay home if they don't feel well, and that you mask as much as you can do in a situation. And um, I love theater, your theater, right? I see your thing there. there. Yeah, so, so I, want, I want you to perform. I, I want the arts to be a part of our lives. Um, and if people get sick, God forbid, they go get tested right away and they isolate until they make sure they're negative. And, um, you know, I don't want people to live in fear, right? And it's that really difficult fine line between fear and motivation and um, understanding that we ne need to recover. We need to have resiliency. People need to feel like there's some peace in their lives. So um, I would say, go for it. If you get in trouble, call us up. We'll come see what we can do to help. All right, thanks. Glad you, glad you have my back. Yeah, we do. <laughs> and I, yeah, let me just say one thing. We have all your backs. That's our role. Sometimes it's a real burden, but, but I just want people to know, um, please feel free to reach out to the health department. Um, sometimes you can always, teresa.cullen at pima.gov, you know, the secret to government email is first.last at pima.gov. But really that's our job. I mean, our job is here to, um, to work with you, to be your collaborator. So thanks. So thank you so much, Dr. Cullen. I, I know you have, you have a few other meetings to get to, I am going to throw in my email address and Dr. Cullen's address in Perfect. the chat. So if you guys have additional questions, feel free to email and I can, either I can wrap them or Dr. Uh, Dr. Cullen can go ahead and wrap them. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And thanks you guys. Thank have you so much. Have a great night. Bye.
Okay. All right. Now uh, we are going to have Tim Metcalf from Farhang and Metcalf Attorneys uh, talk to us a little bit about the mask mandate and the vaccine business implications. Just a quick bio. Um, Tim Metcalf is a managing partner at Farhang and Metcalf. Uh, he is an AV rated attorney who defends clients in the areas of product liability, insurance claims, traditional labor, and all types of employment disputes, as well as commercial litigation. His portfolio is deep and varied, and his focus on maintaining client relationships serves to create long-lasting partnerships with his clients. So without further ado, take it away, Tim. Thanks, Fern. Uh, Fern. Um, Chris, I'll, I'll touch on your question a little bit, too, and, and um, uh, Dr. Cullen was great. Um, if anybody else uh, laughed when she said Lambda and thought of Lambda, 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 then I'm with you. So uh, uh, yeah, I see Michael giving a thumbs up and Chris as well. So those of us that are over the age of 40 know exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody under 40 probably is like, what the hell is this guy saying? Um, yeah, exactly, Fern. Um, <laughs> in any event, uh, uh, especially for those of us in Tucson know that movie well, um, it's Revenge of the Nerds because it was filmed on the U of A campus. Um, but in any event, um, I'm happy to, thanks for the invite. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk to this group about this question. As Dr. Cullen said, there's not a lot of new information, if you will, on this topic, but I, I do want to just um, share with you um, some answers to the questions that the chamber presented to me. And for me, it's a lot more fun to answer questions like you pose, Chris, than it is for me to lecture. So even during this presentation, if you have questions um, as I'm going through material, by all means, raise your hand, put something in the chat, and Fern can interrupt me and I'll be happy to um, answer the question to the best of my ability. So the first question I got asked was, can employers require their employees to become vaccinated? The short answer is yes. Um, I know that there's been a lot of hubbub in the papers and in the press um, as it relates to Governor Ducey's uh, mandates and orders versus Pima County versus school districts and that sort of stuff. But I'm talking about just private sector employers. Let's keep it simple. Most of you on this call are pro probably private sector whether that's for-profit or non-profit. So you can require that your employees be vaccinated. Um, the uh, Empl uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has published information online that confirms that you can do this under federal law. There's no state law exception um, that differs from that. So almost all private sector employers can require their employees to get vaccinated. There are some exceptions. Um, for instance, you need to have carve-outs if somebody has a legitimate religious reason not to get vaccinated. You also need to have a carve out if somebody has a, a, a medical disability uh, for not getting vaccinated. And if an employee basically says to you, hey, I don't wanna get vaccinated or I can't get vaccinated because of my religious um, tenants or my medical condition, then you need to engage in the interactive process with that individual. It's not as simple as you think it should be, um, but it's basically uh, having um, them fill out documentation or getting documentations from their pastor, their religious leader, their medical provider um, that you can then evaluate, does this qualify as legitimate medical reason or religious reason? And if it does, then you can um, uh, uh, accommodate them by not um, requiring a vaccination. Um, this question oftentimes relates back to the mandatory policies versus voluntary policies. Most employers have been, um, you know, voluntarily asking their employees and encouraging their employees to get vaccinated for various reasons. The EEOC also issued some guidance that you can provide incentives for your employees to go get vaccinated. Many of us have heard of, you know, state lotteries of million dollars or more. Um, some of the colleges are offering paid tuition to students that get vaccinated. So there's a fine line between an incentive and coercion, right? Um, so you just need to be leery of that as employers. It's okay to offer gift cards or things of that nature, but if it's too uh, much that you're offering them, then the employee could argue, well, look, I got coerced to get this as opposed to I voluntarily did it. Um, the other thing that's important if you do opt to do a mandatory vaccination policy is one, um, it needs to be put in writing to your employees. You need to, to be very clear on what your policy is. You also wanna give them as much lead time as possible. Keep in mind, as we all probably know, you're not fully vaccinated until two weeks after the Johnson & Johnson dose or two weeks after the Moderna or Pfizer. Um, so you need to give them that lead time to comply with your policy. Uh, you also need to train your managers and your HR reps on compliance with ADA and Title VII issues. The Title VII is religious exemptions. 
the um, ADA's Americans with Disability Act because you don't want to inadvertently have a manager create a claim for you uh, because they say the wrong things or do the wrong things and they accidentally discriminate against somebody that has a disability or legitimate religious reason not to get the vaccine. So it's important to be engaged in, in active training with your managers um, and HR reps to make sure that everybody's complying. And then, you know, like everything, it's not always easy and it's not always black and white. So if you don't know the answer, then tell your managers or HR reps, tell them, I don't know the answer. I need to go look at this. I will get back to you as quickly as I can. There are multiple sources for you to get information, sometimes for free. One, um, if you've got um, payroll handled by an outside payroll company, a lot of times those payroll companies as part of that service that you pay them for provide HR services for you. So if in doubt, you should ask your payroll company if you're using an outside third party vendor, do they provide HR services? And is it rolled into your monthly cost? Because there's no reason to pay somebody like me if you can get it for free or you're already paying for it, right? Second, insurance companies. A lot of insurance companies provide free training on these sort of issues because they want you to avoid creating claims. So they have trainers on staff that answer these questions for you. So that's the second option is to check with your HR, I mean, your insurance broker to find out if they provide training on these issues. Um, the third thing related to that from an insurance perspective is this, there's a policy called Employment Practices Liability Insurance, EPLI is the acronym for that. Oftentimes that's not very expensive for smaller businesses to get a policy. Obviously it's getting more expensive because prior to COVID it was a employer's market, whereas post COVID it's an employee's market. So employees are having a harder time finding another job as a result of COVID in some cases. So they're suing, opting to sue their employer as opposed to just going to take another job. Um, so that, that's something that you should look into um, if you haven't already, um, just to provide you kind of a belt and suspenders and or better protect your business. And obviously if you payroll company or insurance company can't give you the help, then you can obviously reach out to an attorney, somebody like me that specializes in labor and employment issues. I've been doing this for 23 years. And in March of 19, uh, of 20, I should say, when COVID really started coming out, I build more than I've ever built in one month. And I um, started uh, giving more advice to more clients than I ever had before, because we had a lot of people with a lot of unanswered questions. And those questions continue to change um, because this is the, like the virus is the very fluid and things uh, had changed from day to day. I mean, what we were talking about today is much different than what we talked about two months ago or six months ago. Um, so the second question I got asked is, can employers ask employees to provide proof of vaccination or ask if they've been vaccinated? Uh, the short answer again is yes, you can. Um, there are some pitfalls though. Um, confidentiality is a big one. Um, you need to designate one or two people at your company to be asking those questions and to be the, what I call the COVID czar to handle that information because you want them to be giving consistent information uh, to the employees and accurate information, right? Um, and as you know, some of us stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, but that doesn't make us a medical doctor today. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure you're designated somebody that's knowledgeable in the area, is up to date on the law and is providing accurate information. And then whatever uh, uh, copies of the COVID cards, the vaccination cards that you receive, you need to make sure you lock that up in a locked file with medical information, much like you would do with any other medical information, uh, because you need to keep it on a need to know basis. And you have a duty as the employer to protect your employees confidential healthcare information. And this gets back to, you know, mandatory versus voluntary. You know, I tell employers, if you're going to make your uh, mandatory uh, vaccination policy, then you need to ask for proof. Otherwise, you know, employees are going to say, well, you know, Billy said that he got the virus, but he didn't actually get it. So I'm not going to get it either. And I'm just going to lie to my boss. Um, so if you're going to make it mandatory, then you need to ask for the proof. Um, and then you need to, to, to track that. And the other reason why you might want to do that is if and when boosters become necessary, if you have their vaccination card, then you're going to have a better idea when your employee needs to go get their booster. Um, uh, if you're going to adopt a voluntary um, vaccination uh, uh, policy, however, though, I encourage the employer don't ask for the proof because you're asking, um, you know, if it's voluntary, it's on the honor system to begin with. 
So why ask for more healthcare information than you need? Um, by asking for the information, you may inadvertently discover that somebody's got a disability they had no idea about. Now you got to comply with the Americans with Disability Act if you've got 15 or more employees that have uh, been on your payroll for 20 or more weeks in the current or prior calendar year. So I strongly encourage you, if you're going to do a voluntary um, uh, vaccination policy, that you don't ask for the proof because, again, it's voluntary. Um, so it's less paperwork that you got to manage and less claims that you might have to face. Um, in addition, um, uh, you know, you've got a duty to track and update. So for, for instance, if you are keeping that mandatory, making a mandatory policy and, and keeping the um, cards, that's where I'm, I'm talking about the boosters when we get more information on it. I know that it's a little bit inconclusive right now, but some of the more recent studies are showing vaccination effectiveness for about six months. So um, obviously if somebody's got a vaccination card and they're approaching their six month and we get some more guidance from the CDC on this, then it may be that you have to send people out for um, their boosters. Again, whether it's mandatory or voluntary um, and you're asking for proof of vaccination, we need to have a, a COVID czar that's given clear communications, a written policy to your employees so you're providing consistent information and answers um, and you're limiting the information on a need to know basis. Um, so that one person's that designated uh, person or maybe two people in case the COVID czars out on vacation or what have you. Another question I got asked is if a business requires employees to be vaccinated, what legal safeguards do they have to do? Um, so as I mentioned, the clear policies first uh, is key because you know, like a lot of things, um, when people are confused or when they don't have accurate information or they're left to speculate, um, people sometimes get paranoid or go to that dark place in terms of thinking the worst when it's really not that bad. Um, I, I also recommend that you meet individually with your employees if your job force allows you to do that. Otherwise, try to break it up into smaller groups so people feel comfortable asking questions. If you're making a mandatory policy, definitely put it in writing. Um, meet with the employees after you give them a chance to read it, go over it with them uh, verbally, ask them to, to ask you any questions that they might have. Obviously, if you don't know the answer, don't make it up, um, which sometimes I do when my wife and kids ask me things that you know, it goes over okay in the Medcoff household, but not so good when I'm giving legal advice. Um, so, you know, just tell the, the employee that, you you know, it's a great question. I don't know the answer, but I'll find out. And I'll get back to you ASAP. And you probably want to actually notify your entire workforce because that employee might be the only, might not be the only person with that same question. Um, and then after you go answer their questions and go over that written policy with them, have the employee countersign it um, so that they acknowledge they understand the policy and they agree to abide by the policy. And then also explain to them if there are any exceptions to that policy, whether that's a religious reason um, or a, a medical reason. And then also reassure um, with them that you're going to keep whatever healthcare information they provide you confidential. So those are things that you can do to better protect your business if you decide to make it mandatory. And because of the length of time from when the vaccines rolled out and the fact that it is very prevalent, I am seeing a lot more employers make it mandatory. I'm confident once the FDA approves the vaccines, um, no longer on an emergency use basis, but on a permanent basis, that you're going to see even more employers make it mandatory. Um, so these, uh, these sort of um, steps and safeguards that I'm recommending will serve you well when you decide to make it mandatory for your workforce. And again, you want to give them as much notice as possible so that they can um, comply and then ask you questions to the extent they have concerns. So the $64,000 question um, that everybody's confused about, and um, uh, one of the uh, people asked a question earlier, I feel like I'm backpedaling a little bit on the mask mandate. You know, can employers require employees to wear masks? Yes, you can, of course you can. Um, you know, the mask or no ma mask has been a huge debate. It's been a very political debate for a long time, um, unfortunately. Um, you know, originally the benefit of the vaccination was that a lot of employers pushed out there is, hey, you get vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. Well, then the CDC kind of put a, um, a black cloud over that by their most recent guidance that, you know, when you're in a substantial or high risk area, which Dr. Cullen said that we are in Pima County, frankly, pretty much the entire United States is substantial or high risk at this point because of the Delta variant. Um, you know, you've got to wear a mask indoors, according to the CDC. 
uh, if you live in those areas. Um, they, uh, you know, the CDL, CDC also recommends, and, and I tell this to employers all the time, at the end of the day, good employers care about their employees, right? Most of us, our businesses succeed or fail because of our people. And the best way to, to build trust with your people is to talk to them and um, explain to them, look, you know, I want to keep you safe. I have a duty to keep you safe under OSHA. You know, OSHA, the um, Occupational Safety Health Administration, requires us as employers to keep our work environment as safe as possible. So, you know, the safest course of action is require masks for all of your employees and all your customers. Obviously, that's the safest course, but very few businesses are going to do that because if you mandate that all of your customers wear a mask when nobody else is doing it, then they're just going to go to the store next door or the restaurant next door or the theater next door. Um, so the second safest course of action is um, employees um, should wear a mask, uh, especially if they can't socially distance and they're in close proximity with other employees, but it's optional for your customers, right? Um, that's, that's obviously the second safest course of action. I think it was Nick that you'd mentioned about, you know, should we put back plexiglass? Um, a lot of businesses haven't taken it down, but if you have, you may want to put it back up just because of the Delta variant. Um, but it depends on your work environment and kind of proximity and, um, to customers and, and or clients. Tim, in that same vein, we have had some questions about um, requiring volunteers to wear masks or show proof of vaccination cards. Yep. So there's a lot of nonprofits. I saw some uh, as I was looking through the names, some of, some of whom I know well. Um, so yes, you can require you that your volunteers wear a mask. Um, and a lot of times it's easier to ask your volunteers to wear a mask than to ask everybody to provide proof of, uh, of vaccination because a lot of nonprofits have a lot of volunteers that work for them, um, providing their time for free. So yes, you can require a mask um, for your volunteers and you can require vaccination for your volunteers if you want. Just a lot of nonprofits or businesses that rely on volunteers don't wanna to go to that level just because it's hard to get volunteers right now because a lot of the volunteers that a lot of nonprofits rely upon tend to be older people that are more high risk, um, you know, 60 plus, 65 plus, 70 plus. So um, you're gonna uh, oftentimes, um, you're going to alienate some people. You're never going to bat a thousand in terms of keeping everybody happy, but your objective is to keep your business open. Um, and the best way to keep your business open is to have people wear masks if you're not going to have a mandatory vaccination policy for all of your volunteers and all your employees. Because if you've got people working and, you know, half your staff gets sick with COVID, then you have to shut the business down whether there's a lockdown issued by the government or not because you don't have enough people to keep your business open. Um, we did have another question from Long Wendell. Um, are uh, vaccination incentives taxable? Uh, that's a great question. Um, Wendell, for you, CPA? <laughs> so you get the uh, prize for stumping me. Congratulations. Um, uh, the short answer is I, I think um, uh, if, if, you, if you as the employer offer a gift to your employees, um, whether it's a, a $10 gift card or a $100 gift card, I think it's taxable to the employee as, as taxable income. Um, and there may be a tax deduction for the business, uh, potentially from a marketing standpoint or others. You'll need to talk to your CPA or your tax attorney, Wendell. Would anyone like to ask a question in person? You can just raise your hand, or, um, but feel free to to uh, put it in the chat. I know Trot had a, uh, did that answer your question? Um, sorry, I don't know the name. It says Trot on the. I'm just reading the uh, questions in the, uh, in the chat right now. Can the group that leads this require each resident to show proof? So if you're holding an event, so I know that some businesses are holding events now, so especially okay. nonprofits, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, it looks, I unmuted you, uh, Trot representative, okay. sorry, you doesn't tell your name. Trot, I'm Jeff, I'm Hi, the Jeff. director of Trot. Um, Tim already answered the question, but I was confused by a comment somebody put in the um, comment section where it says, by not requiring them to wear masks, you are at risk of an OSHA violation. Is that a question or a statement from Trina? 
So I don't know if that's a question or statement either, but what I will say on OSHA, um, you know, I've had a lot of questions um, from employers as well as employees about um, OSHA compliance. So up until just recently, OSHA was kind of um, uh, leaving all employers uh, to fend for themselves. They really weren't providing any guidance. Um, and most recently, they've started to get involved, um, I think, in part because Biden lit a fire under them. Um, one of the problems that you're going to have under OSHA uh, in terms of a violation pursuant to that comment is proving where did you contract the virus. Um, and I've said this to employers a lot, too, is, you know, it's going to be difficult to prove that you got the virus from X restaurant or from um, you know, a wide grocery store. Um, so um, obviously, if you're doing everything else that you should be doing as an employer, for instance, um, spraying down high touch surfaces um, and keeping a log of that, um, you know, having your employees, for instance, wear masks, those that interact closely with customers or clients, having plexiglass up, um, sterilizing whatever, like if you're a restaurant, all of your plateware and everything else. Um, then it's going to be difficult for OSHA to come in and say that this person contracted COVID from your establishment. Um, and then, Jeff, for you, for the volunteers, I know you guys rely on a lot of volunteers in order to, to provide your services to uh, people with emotional, mental, and physical handicaps um, and challenges. Um, you know, the best course of action for those volunteers is just require them all to wear a mask because they are in close proximity with your clients that you provide your services to for free. Um, and, you know, in order to sidewalk um, uh, somebody with a uh, physical challenge on a horse, you've got to be within six feet um, to make sure that they don't fall off the horse. Um, so uh, obviously by having a mask mandate for those volunteers, that's going to also help you in the event that OSHA does come and, and ask to do an inspection. Looks like Wendell Long wanted to ask Yep. Have a question Go ahead. Have a comment? Hey, Tim, it's Wendell. Uh, I, I don't have a question. I just have a comment on something that you said. And yep. I thought I thought what you said was very kind about, uh, you know, checking with your payroll person or, or, you know, where you can get free advice. And we all love free stuff. But I just wanted the group to know that they're, you know, from my experience running, you know, uh, you know casinos with 10,000 people, nothing is better than talking to an employment lawyer directly. And you can just tell from this talk here how something is more tailored directly to you. So, um, you know, we all like to, to do something free, but it's well worth the investment to make sure that you do this right. Agreed, Wendell, appreciate the plug. And uh, obviously I'm happy to, to get paid for my time too, but um, I'm also happy to volunteer my time for events like this. But for me, those, those that you don't know me, and Wendell knows me, uh, I'm a big believer. My job as a lawyer is to give you information so that you can make informed decisions. And if you've got a good relationship with your lawyer, I'm not here to break up relationships. I'm just here to steer you in the right direction to make sure you're getting the right answers so that you can run your business safely and effectively and avoid claims. Um, and then if you do get hit with a claim, hopefully you have good insurance um, like the Employment Practices Liability Insurance to help um, provide uh, a protection so you're not having to dip into your um, your profits to, to take care of that issue. One of the written questions in the chat was, can the group that leads the event require proof of vaccination? Um, and if not, um, not allow them access to the event? So yes, if you're a nonprofit, for instance, I mean, a lot of nonprofits have not held in-person events for over a year. Um, you as the non, and I'm gonna use nonprofits as an example, but it could be a for-profit business as well, if you want to require all of your attendees to provide proof of vaccination, you can do that. The problem, one, I think your attendance level is going to go from potentially full to 50% because people are going to be like, why can't you just treat me like an adult? And trust that if I'm coming to your event that I'm either vaccinated or I'm going to take precautions to keep myself safe and whoever I interact with safe. So that's issue one. Issue two is the logistics. How are you going to collect that information? Are you going to require everybody who shows up to provide a copy of the vaccination card? And then you're going to verify it? And then what if they doctor a vaccination card? We've heard this online where people have created fake vaccination cards. I mean, are you going to be 
the vaccination police to verify if it's a legit or not, and then tell a guest, like, nope, you can't come in. I don't think this is legit. See you later. Now you're going to not only alienate that person, but probably the five other people that are in line around that person. Um, so, you know, if, if you're that concerned, I would suggest that you postpone your event till later in the year. Um, uh, that would be my suggestion. But obviously you can do what you want and you can proceed forward with your event. I just think you're going to um, create more hard feelings with those attendees than the goodwill you're trying to create by putting on that event. We have a question from Trina Petrash. If you want to uh, go ahead and unmute Trina. That was the same. Hi, uh, the question about the OSHA, it was a, a question. And um, I was the one that asked the OSHA thing and didn't put the question mark on there. So thank you. You answered it. I'm all set. Perfect. No thank you, Trina. And then BJR asked, what can employers do to get all employees to wear masks in the office? So this is a great question, uh, BJR. I'm glad that you asked it. So um, uh, one, you should designate somebody on your team to be the mask police. You don't want employees going around and um, enforcing your rules um, because you're, you know, as much as we like to think kumbaya, all of our employees get along and they're all friends, they're not. And so you're gonna have one person um, um, basically picking a fight with somebody else. Um, so you'd rather just have somebody from HR responsible for enforcing your policies. So your COVID czar, whoever that is, you just tell your employees, look, if somebody's not in compliance or somebody's doing something that's making you uncomfortable, go report it to HR and then let HR deal with it. And then HR can then go approach that employee because that employee uh, may have a medical reason why they can't wear a mask. For instance, they've got severe asthma and they presented medical documentation that if they wear a mask, it could cause them to not get enough oxygen and faint. Um, uh, again, you know, I'm going to an extreme here as an example, but there are legitimate reasons why some people can't wear a mask. So you don't want employees basically micromanaging this. You want to leave that in the hands of your HR rep or whoever your COVID czar is. James Beard had a question in the chat. He said, do we need to change upgrade COVID signs on our office doors? Well, it depends on what your COVID sign says, right? <laughs> um, odds are you probably don't. Um, you know, um, you know. For instance, um, if you are an employer that requires all of your employees to to get vaccinated, you may want to change your sign to provide your your customers some peace of mind that they know when they walk into your work environment that everybody's vaccinated. If in fact that's true, um, so for instance, that might be a sign that you might want to put up. Um, because that's going to help from a marketing standpoint and or to provide comfort to your clientele that enter your establishment. Um, but uh, for the most part, you, you know, again, if if you're doing what I kind of recommended, the second safest, and that is employees wear masks and make it optional for in, uh, your clients, then if your sign says everybody needs to wear a mask because that's what Pima County or the city used to require, then you could change your sign to say all employees will wear masks, but it's optional for our clients. Great. Well, that our time is up. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, again, um, this is one of the initiatives of the chamber is to just stay out in front of business issues and try to keep our members informed. Um, if there's any further questions, again, I'm putting my email in the chat. Um, you can go ahead and send me that information and I can forward it to the appropriate person. And also, if you'd like to find new ways to get involved with our chamber, um, again, I'm available. Let me know. Thank you, everybody, for, for your time and for joining us. And thank you, Tim, for um, lending us your expertise. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, everyone.